Uh, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Frontier Opening Bell this Monday, the 7th of September. Welcome, Alec Ansachu, CEO and uh, uh, founder at Arunich uh, Frontiers Management. Good morning, Gali. Good morning. Good to see you as always, boss. Hope you had a very great weekend. I did. Thank you. Thank you. And Joshua Debussy from Vetiva Capital Management, the head of banking analysts at the investment and securities trading firm. Morning, Joshua. Morning, boss. Thank you. It's good to see both of you. Bright and early, let's hit the ground running. Quite a, a bit of ground to cover today as we look at the closing uh, levels for five of the African exchanges we cover for equities. Nigeria we had a big jump on the bank on the back of the banking earnings, 1.17 percent. The Ivorian market was up half a percent. The Egyptian market uh, was beating 2.46 percent. Kenya was up 0.37, and South Africa took 1.18 percent um, pullback on the. Thursday and Friday, massive sell-off that we saw in U.S. and in Europe. But that is a bit of reversing early today. Uh, a bit of brand new trading week we're starting right now. Uh, check us through the East African market where the central bank in Kenya says the TV auctions uh, late last week was overbought, raised about $10 billion, uh, in, uh, in Kenya shillings. Kenya total public debt, about $6.693 trillion at the end of June. Meantime, the Shelter Africa gets about 1.01 billion shillings additional capitalization from Nigeria. And Uganda, independent sources, says the country will lose about $2 billion in tourism revenue because of the virus pandemic. And Ethiopia will generate about $4 billion from exports in 2020-2021 period. Or some of these are just sell assumptions, assumptions as it were. Ali, uh, getting quickly on the East African market for us. So let me start with your headline, uh, T-bill auctions were underbought. What we've seen in the last two to three weeks is a theme where uh, the banks who are the main buyers of government securities have been going out the curve. So we've seen undersubscription in the front end of the curve, i.e. one year and under instruments. Um, and we've seen a, a, a better buying um, further out the curve, 5, 10, uh, 10, uh, 10 year plus issuances. So basically, um, we're seeing people uh, extend maturity on government securities, and that's meant an undersubscription in the front end and an oversubscription in the longer end. And that uh, has been a theme that we've seen for the last three to four weeks, which is interesting, worth keeping an eye on. Um, but I don't think uh, one should be alarmed by the undersubscription in the short end. It's just signaling this curve extension that we're seeing. Kenya's total public debt close to 7 trillion shillings. This is um, an issue for not only Kenya, but many other African countries who went into this crisis with fully loaded balance sheets um, and essentially have had to borrow more in order to deal with the COVID economic emergency. Uh, the issue for uh, Kenya will be um, giving comfort to, uh, to those who've lent them money about how they're going to bring this and stabilize this debt profile and hopefully bring it lower in the next few years. And I think that's an important messaging component, not only for Kenya, but for many other African countries who find themselves in a similar situation. Kenya Shelter Afrique. Uh, Shelter Afrique is a provider of, of funding for housing. Um, uh, they had a couple of big hits a couple of years ago, restructured the top management, restructured the balance sheet. And I think this is an important signal of confidence in the new regime and the new approach. Um, that's uh, about $10 million of additional capital coming from Nigeria. Um, and I think, uh, that, you know, Shelter Afrique will take that as, as, as a vote of confidence in, in the approach. Uganda, 1.4 to 1.7 million tourists annually. Um, some great sites that they have there, Murchison Falls, the Gorillas, uh, Windy Forest, just to name a few. Um, and this is, you know, the estimate is Africa is going to drop $30 billion of tourism revenue this year. 
and that's commensurate with Uganda's position of $2 billion. You know, the tourism sector, I think, has been at the sharpest end of this COVID-related uh, economic slump. Um, obviously, people are not flying like they used to, um, and most of our tourism sectors are outward-facing. Domestic tourism hasn't really taken off um, to compensate for international tourism. And uh, Uganda had their own airline as well. But I don't see any recovery until the middle of next year at the earliest, because I think it's a lot to do with behavioral economics. You know, are people keen to go travel far in the current environment? And also insurance. You know, most of these tourists are coming in packages, in groups, and they're all, uh, one of the key components of that travel is that they can get insurance. And at the moment, I'm not uh, certain that that insurance is forthcoming. And Kenya is suffering, I think, from the same scenario. You can open up, you can say we're open for business, but if the uh, tourists cannot be insured, they're not going to come. And I think that's the challenge for now. Ethiopia to generate $3.9 billion from exports um, I would have thought it's going to be a slightly lighter number um, because of all the unrest we saw uh, over the last few months. Um, but Ethiopia ha has this big problem in the sense that its investments are far out, its imports are far outstripping its exports, and they need to do something about that. Uh, the currency has been weakening, um, and there's a lack of currency in the system. And there will need to be a currency adjustment at some point to reflect that reality. Quite, quite a whole lot within the uh, uh, East African uh, space. Let, let's touch base with the Nig Nigerian West African uh, base again. The Nigeria's banking industry last week uh, took the shine off any other news on Market Street, as it were. Even though Jais Bank, which is a non-interest listed lender, forecasts is four quarter. Uh, gross earnings uh, for, for the year uh, and give a, a bit of a forecast uh, heads up there on Q4 uh, end in December. In Ivory Coast, Cocoa Board, which is the uh, agency responsible for uh, cocoa sales and all of that, uh, reported 216 million um, CDs lost in the 2014-2015 season. Uh, a bit of a backward looking uh, numbers, by the way. Uh, Nigeria Treasury Auctions, 22 billion. Uh, CFA in, uh, uh, in Treasury bills. Nigerian president goes to Niger today uh, to, to wade into some political uh, issues uh, with Mali and all of that. And you are more import by countries, according to Financial Africa, total 18.698 francs in 2019. Um, Joshua, a quick one. What more do, do we, did we gather from the bank's uh, earnings books over the weekend? Drilling down. Well, okay, so drilling down, I think, firstly, the pattern we have recognized is that um, only two banks really dropped their um, dividend payouts. And this, this, those two banks were Stambik and UBA. And funny enough, those two banks actually um, are performed year on year in terms of profit growth. But so I think they chose to lower their... Um, they chose to lower their dividend payouts more in order to um, maintain a higher level of retained earnings rather than, you know, because of a bad performance. But overall, I think, you know, when we look at operating expenses for, for all the banks, they went up across the board. And this was, you know, mostly due to Amcon charges. A couple of banks did give out donations that really um, significantly, you know, affected op OPEX, but upcut charges, um, deposit insurance were two massive charges that really um, upped OPEX and, you know, affected profitability to a certain extent. Now, going forward and looking into what is the second half of the year, we don't expect these same um, issues and these same charges to arise. And, you know, as economic activity starts to resume, we expect that, you know, there will be a little bit of a rebalancing. And so we can see some non-interest income, you know, recovery, even though non-interest income did, like we had expected, support the bank's um, earnings because interest income took a massive hit across the board, um, as we had predicted it would. So things like fees and commissions well, will remain down 
mostly as a result of the change in um, formula from the CBN who released the circular earlier on this year that sort of changed, you know, how much bank charges are cost. So, you know, you see, you know, fees are lower and banks pay a little bit higher. So on, on, a, on a net basis, net fee and commission income has gone down. But when you look at the revaluation gains, that's another thing that, you know, the banks have really benefited from. The, the double um, devaluation of the Naira has really boosted a lot of these banks. The only bank that we saw that didn't get a net gain from that was Access Bank, which still recorded a net loss. After recording one in Q1, they recorded a, a smaller one of about 11 billion in Q2. So hopefully that means that by Q3, they'll be in the positive. Um, and then by Q4, they'll be making profits. But either way, um, all the other banks gained significantly in terms of um, your foreign currency revaluation gains and things like that. Then, you know, gains from investments. All these things have really supported the banking system. And so non-interest income has really been, you know, the saving grace for these banks and has really helped to maintain profitability. And also to add some, you know, context to Zenit Bank's amazing results, 103 billion in profits. They recorded only 10 billion in um, tax in Q2, or in fact, yeah, in Q2. So that's really boosted their, their profits for, for the half year. Now, obviously, the tax is going to regularize in the second in the second half of the year. But I mean, it's still a very encouraging encouraging figure. One would almost wonder why they didn't even increase their dividend payouts because I think that it would have been an opportunity to sort of show investors that you know not only are we in a, a strong position, but I think we're, they're still growing and they could have even boosted. Because if they had boosted their dividend payouts, they would have given an indication to. Um, investors that, who knows, their final dividend might be even higher. And that would have really, really raised their, um, raised their share price and would have, you know, had an effect on, on their current target price as well. Because... Joshua, Joshua maybe they're just saving the best for last. Ali, isn't it? Maybe sometimes you just... <laughs> maybe they're sure, maybe sure. maybe save the best for last. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I would hope so. I would hope so. Because the truth is that um, investors are really, really focused on the dividend payouts. That's, that's one of the, the things that local investors, you know, have always paid attention to. And so a raise in, you know, dividend payouts will definitely boost their share price and, you know, increase their value. But like you said, maybe they're saving the price for a lot. Right? Yes, I know the, the Kenyan banks, the investors in Kenya also uh, uh, like dividend payouts. Uh, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the um, key issues for uh, Kenyan banking stocks is the dividend. People invest in those stocks for that income stream. Um, and uh, we've had a, a similar debate here because... The central bank has said that for this full year, they will have a supervisory role to play in dividend payouts, which has made a, a lot of investors very unhappy because they're saying, you know, the decision should be the bank's decision. Um, of course, uh, a, a lot of banks uh, full year last year, um, uh, having announced dividends, then skipped cash payments and did things like uh, bonus shares and so forth in order to conserve cash, um, which, other, which added fuel to the fire. But as Joshua was saying, um, you know, I think uh, he was saying that it, it, they should have paid one because it would have sent a big signal to investors. I think he's absolutely right. In a tough environment, uh, if you're able to maintain or increase your payout, um, you're going to get a significant re-rating in your share price because of the certainty of the cash flow. So it is a big debate. It is a question as to how long this whole uh, downturn will go on and whether we've passed the worst or we got, or we got something still to come at us. <laughs> Interesting. In dividend pay uh, environments such as Nigeria, Kenya, and a few other jurisdictions, Again, depending on the class of investors, we see the average age of investors in Nigeria and Kenya. Uh, I think uh, uh, those folks want uh, their dividend. Dividend is uh, is uh, is this Christmas every half year, and at the end of the year, they just don't want to miss it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
says it's Christmas twice a year. They want to have it. But let's uh, talk about Southern Africa. I shall with the South African market to get uh, a beating last week. Well, it was all expected, by the way. Meantime, Malawi's economy contracts 1.9%. Will contract 1.9% in 2020. GSC receives approval to acquire Link Market. Uh, a bit of improving technology, innovation, and digital uh, services with uh, the uh, Africa's most uh, la largest uh, exchange there, um, exchange with derivatives and, and all of that. Uh, MNR um, hit by Musanada's notice to draw down some 745 million Rand guarantee. City Lodge. Reports uh, 486 .6 rand uh, net loss for a uh, year to June. And Santam, which is the insurer, will set to claims worth 250 million rand, 1.3 billion rand set aside for policyholders. Ali, you want to start with Santam? Yes, I, I think you know what we're looking at here is quite a tough environment for um, the insurance companies. Um, in, in particular, uh, um, uh, in particular, we've got this issue with, um, uh, you know, uh, health-related uh, claims and so forth. One second. Go ahead, Ali. Yes, so we've got this issue with uh, uh, health-related health claims and so forth, which means that it's a tough year for insurance companies. We saw that with Old Mutual as well. Investments on the investment side have not been easy um, either because the markets have been in a soft spot across the continent. So uh, it's to be expected. I don't think there was anything out of the ordinary, but they're just speaking to the strength of the company and that they are willing to settle claims of that amount. The announcement by JSE with respect to um, uh, Market Link, uh, Market Link is a share registry company. So you're seeing an interesting development by the JSE as they seek to extend the range of services uh, that they provide. And I think uh, that's, that's, uh, that that's, uh, speaks to the innovation at the JSC. It is, of course, the most innovative stock exchange on the continent, um, reported really strong profits uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I think is a very interesting business uh, for investors to keep an eye on. Malawi, uh, you know, we've had the change of government. We've had an upturn in levels of optimism. Um, uh, uh, we expected uh, a negative growth this full year, given the earlier turbulence, political turbulence we saw. But I think, you know, many of us are keeping an eye on Malawi and are becoming a little bit more optimistic that the new political dispensation um, uh, it looks promising uh, from uh, from our side, um, and I think investors, although it's a very nascent market, uh, it's got a T-bill market, it's got a small stock market. I've been and visited there, um, uh, but I think you know, keep an eye on on developments because when the political trajectory changes, it also creates a lot of opportunity as well. Um, and then finally, Murray and Roberts, which is the big South African uh, construction company. Uh, this claim is related to Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, they're saying it's neutral on the balance sheet and earnings. Um, but they've really, the big story there is that they've, they're exiting the Middle Eastern market. This is part of the noise um, around that exit. But, you know, they are a significant player in the construction space. Uh, thank you, Ali, so much. Uh, Joshua, what's your uh, take on the market week on this bank earnings? Do you think uh, we've seen such a big uh, reaction last week? Is there anything still left uh, in those earnings that could push investors' uh, sentiments in, sense that in, in terms of pricing this bank's uh, shares upward as we start a new week? Well, the truth is that I think, to be a little bit cynical, any gains we see on these banks, you know, on the back of these positive um, results would likely be tempered by some, some sell-offs and some, some profit-taking, you know, some people who are not even willing to wait for the dividend payout to, to get their, you know, dividend yield who would just rather take the, the profit that they'll get because the likelihood is that anything they'll see in terms of capital appreciation will probably outweigh the, the gains that they might make on on the mm -hmm. dividend payout. So 
likelihood is that even though we have seen some positives and we will see some more some more buy 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 side sentiment, the likelihood is we'll see some sell offs and some some um, profit taking to by by the end of the week anyway. So it's sort of temperate slightly, but the trajectory is definitely upwards overall. Um, and I think it's definitely a positive for the, the market as a whole. But definitely not 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 a sharp decline, not anything like that for the banks this week. No, absolutely not. The the, the results have been too positive across the board. Like we had we had expected. I mean, we knew I'd said before that you know the banks were going to come out of this definitely positively, and outside of Access Bank, who their own issues would have prevented them from having significant gains, anyways. All the other banks had have, have done quite well. Now, I, I, you know, also would like to have imagined that, you know, say for COVID nineteen, if there hadn't been this pandemic, the banks would have done extremely well this year. So I think that's that's giving some encouragement to um, to investors as well, because that means you know you can look towards next year for some very very positive, um, positive results from these banks. So if anybody wants to take a position long term, now would be the time. Now, now is the time. Now is the time to look at North African space very quickly. Uh, what's the story with the banks there, the Egyptian uh, bank, Audi? Uh, first, Abu Dhabi Bank is resuming talks to buy uh, the Egyptian units of this Lebanon's uh, bank, Audi. Uh, meantime, Morocco's uh, FDI drops to 1.5%. That's quite huge uh, in, in local currency terms. That's about 9.02 billion dirhams. Egypt's uh, central banks issues a treasury bills worth 19 billion, uh, nearly 20 billion Egyptian pounds on Sunday is still fast and furious on treasury bills by central bankers. GDX economy grows 3.5% in full year 2019-2020 against uh, a much uh, forecast, uh, uh, higher forecast by, according to the Minister of Finance. Not bad, by the way, Ali, is it? No, not at all. I mean, I, I think 3.5% uh, is something most countries would take with both hands right now. Um, and it speaks to the resilience of the economy. S&P also addressed this issue. Um, it's very diversified. It's, it's, it's got a strong manufacturing sector. And um, I think if that's, the, if that's the low for Egypt, that looks pretty good because they've taken some big hits. You know, tourism is down bigly um, and a couple of other areas. But uh, um, I think that that was a good outcome. Uh, the T-bill issuance is going to carry on. There are big, big uh, issuers of T-bills, and we should continue to expect that to continue. There's a lot of uh, domestic appetite from the banks and international appetite from carry traders um, to run the Egyptian trade. The currency has been very, very stable. It is one of the most attractive carry trades anywhere in the world today. First, Abu Dhabi looking again at an acquisition in Egypt makes sense. Abu Dhabi's population is, you know, 200,000 or something. Egypt is more than 100 million people market. You know, if you're playing in the Middle East, the Egyptian market is somewhere where you'd like to have a toehold. So uh, that's an interesting development. And also speaks to the politics of the uh, strong connection between the UAE and President Sisi's um, uh, Egypt, that's been there for a long time, geopolitically, politically, economically, um, you had these interconnection points. And then Morocco, yes, I agree with you, it's quite a sharp slide, but it tells you about Morocco's sensitivity to global FDI and global trade, which has been in a bit of a tailspin. But again, I think that probably is the flaw now, and we should start seeing a recovery in those numbers going forward. It's going to be a whole lot more tomorrow when we come back. Inflation uh, numbers from, from um, a few African countries today, Mozambique is on tap, Ghana, uh, Angola, Tanzania. So let's uh, chat to this tomorrow. Then, of course, Rwanda. Uh, Central Bank just released a monetary policy and financial stability report for the first half of the year. The, the whole lot of that will be on our radar tomorrow. So thank you so much. It's a Monday. Uh, let's uh, I leave it there for today. Thank you both of you. Joshua DBC from Bativa Capital Management, the head of banking analysis, uh, analyst there. You know, thank you so much, Joshua. Thank you, Boston. Thank you. It's good to have you, Brighton. And Ali Kansaju, thank you so much. 
to for uh, drilling down on a number of issues for us as well. Thank you both. Have a great week yeah. ahead, and let's uh, congregate together again tomorrow here on Frontier Africa Reports. Thank you so much, and Thank see you. Time.